Welcome to the Utah Pride Center. Some of the young people who have been involved with the GSA network have been here for the last few days, the last week. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for staying on after two really grueling days. We appreciate um, you. We appreciate the work that's been done by young people from all over the country for the GSA network. So thank you to them. Thank you to everybody else who is here as well. Um, it is a very special day for us. We've been thinking about this event We've been thinking about the GSA national event, and we've been thinking about how we connect our own story to that event. And this has been very, very special in what we've been able to do, and I hope it's going to be an enjoyable evening for you. Um, it's not going to be a very long evening. Um, in the middle of April, we opened this brand new building. We, um, through the work of one of the people sitting over here, um, Carol, as the previous director of the Utah Pride Center, we found this space and we came to the space and we have made it ours. And in April, um, at that opening, um, one of the things that I mentioned as the incoming um, executive director was that this is a space where we acknowledge that we're engaging minds and voices in the pursuance of the objectives and strategies beneficial to our communities. And then most importantly and most applicable to tonight, we remember the work that has been done by those who have come before us. And we pay tribute to their dedication and the sacrifices that have gotten us to where we are today. Within this space, we strive for kindness, thoughtfulness, acknowledgement, and the dignity of everyone. Tonight, we are able to sit and listen to some of those who paved the way for the young people at the GSA National Conference, for many of the young people here in Utah, and it's an absolute privilege for me to be able to welcome, I'm going to start on that side, Leah Farrell, oh, oh. Ivy Fox, and the inimitable Carol Gennardi. Sorry, the rest of you do deserve adjectives, but Carol, <laughs> Carol's comes with her. Um, so what I would like to do, we're going to be talking about 20 years since... Um, East High, the students of East High and West High walked out of school in pursuance of an objective that changed Utah. And what I thought we would start with was by asking the three panelists just to introduce themselves to the audience, for those of you that don't know them, and to tell us name, pronouns if they prefer. I see they are on the front of the, the um, speaker's cards. Um, and what you did, what was your role in this case? So we'll start here with Carol and then just move along the line and just, just a few minutes about how you kind of came to this thing and where you come, yeah, here you are. Well, this is just so exciting for me. And I'm gonna, I always start to cry, so. Um, it was, um, I got a call from the Tribune that um, there was gonna be a walkout at the high school. And um, of course, at that time, you just start thinking, you know, what does this mean in the, in the world of civil rights and what does this mean to Utah? Well, right away, you know, we knew, because this was on the heels of Wendy Weaver, which Wendy Weaver was a teacher that had been fired because she's, she told a young person at a softball game that she was the coach of that she was going to, uh, that she was a lesbian. So she told this young man that she was a lesbian he went home and told his mother. His mother ended up having her fired from her job as a coach. She was an award-winning coach and psychology teacher. 
So that kind of opened the door, and I think at that time, we uh, GLSEN, which is another national organization, a teacher's organization, um, started uh, a chapter here with some amazing teachers that from all over the state, that some of them might not have been out at the beginning, and then they did come out uh, during that Wendy Weaver case. So that case was developing and then uh, in the courts and then the walkout. I think it, it really showed how it empowers, you know, one act empowers the next and the next. And those courageous young people did that walkout and they meant it. It was big, it was huge. And you'll see some pictures over there from that. And um, so my first reaction, my first understanding about it was this is very big. And um, just a side note, but a very important one, is about the press. The press, um, the reason we found out about it, the way we found out about all of our cases was really through the press, giving the ACLU a call, and the ACLU was there. So um, that, that's what happened on that day. I could, I could go on about other things, but I think that I'll, um, I'll stop there and just say that, that my role, the next part of my role was, we did not have a lawyer at that time. We were in between lawyers. So I looked at my role as finding the right lawyers that were our volunteer lawyers in our community. Some of the best and brightest people in First Amendment law, in, in law in general, but mostly civil rights law. But so like really, right? Incredible, yeah. incredible. Incredible people. And so we we got them on board and then and then things really started to roll. And none of them were given any, like, they were not guaranteed any wages, any sort of pay. Like, this was a pure, like, love and caring kind of moment. It was right. really powerful. The whole thing was powerful. Mm -hmm. And then the students, of course. I mean, the students, you know, if, if you're ever thinking that your rights are being violated, you just remember you have that right, you have that power, and you have an ACLU wherever you live. And, um, and, and then to just speak about the center. The center at the time was not, um, it was just developing itself. And it, of course, didn't have Gay Straight Alliance kids or it had some kids coming, you know, to, uh, coming to uh, be, in, be in a safe place and whatever. But uh, the, the center was just developing then. So the center wasn't involved in Gay Straight Alliances because there weren't any. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, it's evolved and it's a constant evolution. Yeah. You. Um, <laughs> I am Ivy Fox. I am a former plaintiff in both of the GSA um, versus the Board of Education cases. Started with that first initial one with the GSA with the non-curricular clubs. Um, ended up kind of creating that loophole second um, conc concurrent um, lawsuit with curricular clubs and yeah and we started the free school clubs a district-wide coalition uh, we also kept as our youth run uh, yeah my name is Leah Farrell uh, so I went to West High School and um, yeah I remember you know it was my senior year um, when you know this you know I was sort of approached and talked approach to be a plaintiff in this case and um, Ivy had been doing such amazing work organizing I you know had you know participated in the walkout I was aware of what was going on but I also was like looking towards leaving Utah <laughs> you know, I was about to graduate and I was like okay I'm definitely leaving the state um, you know I, I feeling a little claustrophobic here um, and, you know, so what, you know, I remember having that question of like, well, what does this mean to be a plaintiff? Like, what am I taking on? But I mean, clearly I had, you know, Ivy had been so brave, the other East High students have been so brave to really bring this issue to the forefront. And I, yeah, clearly had to, you know, participate and become a plaintiff and, you know, a, you know, supportive of my LGBT community, but also of the fact that it just was so clearly wrong that the school district had 
shut down all clubs and kept students from meeting simply because they were afraid of gay people. Like it was yeah. so wild. So weird. <laughs> so wild. And as a you know, eighteen year old, seventeen year old, like I yeah, I knew that that just didn't make sense and it felt inherently wrong and so um, yeah, so that's how I became a plaintiff <coughs> from West High and I want to like, can I talk about it too? Because like at the time it was like so important though, right? We had to have like a strategic partnership with all of the schools. Every student was impacted. Leah was the captain of her soccer team. Like she cared so much and like she was popular and people cared about her and like her opinion mattered. And like the more allies that we got, the more momentum they had. And it was a huge deal and it took a ton of bravery, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to sort of three stages of questions. I'm going to ask about um, then, so that those actual moments of walking out, those experiences of how you mobilize those people, what that felt like, what was the experiences at school. Um, Ivy and Leo are going to have to think back 20 years. Carol's thinking back 20 years, so that might get a bit tricky. But we're going to look at that. <laughs> then we're going to look at, then I'm going to ask questions around the case. Because then the next thing that obviously evolved out of that action was the case and the experiences through the case. And then I'm finally going to ask around, well, what about now? But before I ask the first question, I was, I, I'm clearly not a native Utah. Um, so I've been doing a lot of reading. And I was reading some of the many articles and things today. And I never wander into the comment section of an article, but I did today. And one of the articles came from the Salt Lake um, Tribune. And in the comments, I thought I wanted to read something. I can't tell who this is from. It's from somebody whose name is obviously some sort of pseudonym. And this is what they said. Marching out of class up to the Capitol and then to the school district offices in support of equal rights was one of the moments of my teenage years that changed me forever. I remember that the principal got on the PA system the morning of the walkout threatening anyone who would join. And I was one of three people in my math class that walked out anyway. There were probably a, at least a few hundred of us out of the 2,200 or so student body who marched. I often wonder if the state was hoping that the public would turn on gay teens and blame them instead of blaming the state for taking all the clubs away. It did the opposite, and instead galvanized the students against the administration, the state, and the people who had been indifferent about gay rights, myself included, suddenly became supporters. So to link with what Carol said, one small act has led to somebody 20 years later reflecting on how that changed their life, and continues to. So let's start with, um, I'm going to start with um, Leah on the other side there. T tell me about, we, we, um, Ivy alluded to the fact that you were popular, you were kind of this cool <laughs> kid in school, you were a <laughs> soccer captain. What did people, what did your peers say when they, when they went, what are you doing? How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, yeah, it, it was an interesting situation because my, I, I do have to say my peers were really, good if, if quiet. <laughs> yeah. I do. Like, there really wasn't, a, you know, uh, a lot addressed, but I do remember my, you know, soccer coach, like, uh, at, you know, not, not from high school, but my, out, you know, my competitive league and we're sort of warming up and he like walks over to me and he's like, good job. I saw, I saw the news report. Good job. And I was like, whew. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I thought, you know, he'd be supportive, but it was just a little bit of a mixed bag, yeah. you know, it just um, wasn't really clear, but kind of like your, the comment you read, that it, it in many ways also showed who, you know, people who would talk about it and come up to me and talk to, talk about the, the lawsuit showed who was supportive, and that meant a lot. Yeah. You know? Ivy, what about yourself? How did you, you had a, I've heard you on some news reports talking about a different experience yeah. around your presence and in that space. Yeah. yeah. And your peers in particular. Um, I think that like at, G at East High, there was a real need for the GSA and that's why the students chose, like had asked to create a group. Um, 
and because of that, um, a number of students were targeted. I do think there were a number of students who were blamed for this, and it took a lot of education. It did take the four years of educating everybody and shifting that and making everybody really see a full picture. Um, I think that humans can be very disappointing sometimes, you know, and they can shock the heck out of you. So, like, getting all these students that did shift their narrative, it was like, it was obvious that this was a whole system issue. There were teachers that would not, yeah, that wouldn't engage with us in the same way, which was so disappointing. Like, our educators didn't get it. What a disappointment. I'm sure you get that too. Um, and um, some students were like physically assaulted. I, my locker was broken into regularly. My tires were slashed regularly. But again, like this was like, those are materials. And no one had the spine to actually come to me and talk to me. I had a lot of support. We care. Like when you are caring and generous and that is who you are and that is the place you're coming from, it is difficult to be a horrible person to your face. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm going to make it hard on you, you know? Um, and I think that other students, and I've said this before, that um, I am very privileged. I am a white woman who had two parents that were willing to sign on to a case that was a big deal and could have put us at, like, and did put us at risk, you know? Um, and there were many students in that school that did not have that. And it was just like Leah, like this was obvious. Like clearly I'm gonna put my name on that. Like this is, yeah, it's something beyond us. Um, so it was much bigger than any one of us. Did, did either of you at the time think of yourselves as activists or people who are going to 20 years later sit in front of a room yeah. full of people um, telling your story, or was it just I'm doing this? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because the power of the people don't stop. The power of the people yeah. are here, right? I came from the hippies, so yeah. Yeah. so I knew how the power of the people, and the power of the people don't stop. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think my my personality was a little more dreamy is a little more <laughs> dreamy and shy. You know, I, I definitely was. Again, yeah, sort of focused on sports and academics, and but yeah, I mean, we you know we grew up together. We were raised by a culture of active people, people who were active around issues of um, poverty and the rights of people in Salt Lake. I mean, so yes. you know, it was ingrained in us to see injustice, and and then you know, in whatever style made sense to you know push against it. So. Good yeah. top, bad cap. <laughs> 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 um, fondest memory of those school times, yeah. or conversely, your worst memory of those school times, if you're happy to share it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just one thing that comes to mind that, yeah, when Ivy mentions, like, people can shock you, I mean, there, yeah, were, you know, of course, huge decision point moments, like deciding to join the case, um, or, yeah, getting my deposition taken, like, those are big, impactful moments, but, you know, I was finally graduating, and I, you know, was in my gown and walking across the stage, and of course, I, I don't know if it happens this way, but now, but then, a school board member hands you that, like, fake diploma <laughs> as you walk across the stage. It's ironic. And this school board member handed it to me and like, you know, the, we did, did the fake smile and she would like whispers to me like, I don't know if I want to give this to you since you're suing me. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> you know, it, it was both, it was like that, like, oh gosh, like, you know, I got a little like flustered, but um, really also then it, it really flipped really quickly to become in many ways a very empowering moment because I, I realized she was so angry and bitter and I was just happy to be asserting my <laughs> rights and to be you know celebrating with my friends and it just really showed that um, yeah where we were coming from so it's both good and yeah. or bad and good memory. Yeah. I think. Oh gosh I think that there were like so many wild and incredible moments where people did surprise you in the most like positive way and just like the ripples that 
our words have, whether they're positive or negative. I was flown to the Millennium March on Washington for equality for 2000 and um, speak, spoke in front of 700,000 people in like the most like loving environment like that and you know like when you have that much energy it was like so wild um and to know that like we can foster that and like create that in our own spaces too so that was like unreal after where people came up and just like say how we ripple how all of us ripple and the connections that we created like i have lifelong friendships with people and like now on the internet even on facebook people being like god i hope i was one of the friends like tell me i was one of the friends and, like, you know like I'm glad you're thinking that way. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the case, and I'm going to just ask Carol some questions. But before um, I move on to that, I just want to point to just a quick quote from somebody from the, like from many of you will remember, or I'm not sure if she's still in town, the lovely Gail Rizika, president of the Utah Eagle Forum, who declared before the case started the following. We are going to win this battle, and Utah will again be at the forefront. Homosexuals cannot reproduce, so they recruit. They are not going to use Utah high schools and junior high schools as campuses to recruit. Um, love to meet Gail. She sounds delightful. Um, so the case starts. Carol hears about it in the press. She moves to, to go and meet some of these students. Tell us. Um, this was the first of its kind. How did this it was the first of this kind of course Tell here. Us how you brought um, this there to were you. other states that already had <coughs> gay straight alliances, um, but, um, but that we'll talk about the law a little later. But um, the the thing that I did was first of all it called Lambda. Um, Lambda is another national organization, and we had a great relationship with John Davidson and then uh, Dave Buckle, uh, who's no, no longer with us. He um, and they, they jumped right on it, and they got a hold of the National ACLU office, to, we did, to get them hooked up with them. And then the National Center for Lesbian Rights got involved, Kate Kendall came. So we had, like, the best and the brightest of lawyers from all over the country. People that were there and ready and studied, <coughs> really studied the law and, and whatever the law there was. And, um, and then we had the plaintiffs. So, we were in such good shape. We had all sorts of people. Uh, locally, uh, Laura Gray, one of our fine attorneys, she was our local attorney. And uh, in my discussions with her in the past, and even recently, she reminded me about how she really developed the plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. So she, she, you know, we had a, a, a group of plaintiffs, but we wanted more. And um, and so what she did was she kind of educated you about the case as as the, it was developing itself after we found out about the legislative research that they'd done. Um, and you're going to talk about that a little later about Maybe. Orin. Yeah. 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 Orin Hatch is the champion. In this yeah. Story, but. Yeah. <laughs> but those uh, those attorneys were all really well equipped to handle this, to handle plaintiffs and everything. So. It, it worked very smoothly, it, it, and, but all along, you know, we had people, and we've got teachers here that were involved in that, and um, we had rallies. We had, you know, it, it, didn't just, it wasn't just a lawsuit that was sitting there. There were all sorts of things going on, and then our legislature, the Senate, had a closed meeting where they showed a really vile movie that was the leadership of Gail Rizika, and so we had a lawsuit against the Senate for having a closed-door meeting. So, you know, there were all those so kind of secondary yeah. things that were, were going on at that time. So. Yeah. Tell us just a little bit just quickly about the timeline of the, the, when they shut down the, the clubs and when you guys got involved. Or, because they shut down every club. I mean, we're talking, the ones I was reading about was hilarious. There were chess clubs shut down, beef clubs, frisbee clubs, Bible clubs, <laughs> um, the Aztec clubs. Um, they closed a lot. 46. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it, it didn't happen overnight. No. Yeah, I think it was '95 when the um, yeah. students, at, yeah, at, at East were organizing and and sort of you know pushing, and then yeah, was it the '96 legislative yeah. session? Yeah. I have some of the really early history 
three for yeah. that first year. So yeah. we, we started meeting for about a year, and we wanted to reach out to the other students that didn't have support, didn't have friends, didn't have family that could support them. We're still in the closet. So we wanted to start putting up flyers. So we just, we've been meeting for a year, and then we put up flyers. All the flyers got taken down, and we assumed it was um, homophobia. And then we found out it was because we had to have like a, a stamp on them from the school. And the vice principal wasn't supportive. I really felt like he was homophobic. So we met with the principal of the school, and he was apprehensively supportive. He said, I do need to run this by the school board. And we thought, OK, this is all going to go through. Yeah. And then they had their meeting, and they decided that we couldn't meet anymore. And then, and then it became a really big deal. But we've been meeting for a year. Wow. Introduce yourself. Oh, I would love that. Oh, yes, yeah, please. Joelle and Mandel. <coughs> so, and I think um, uh, like we always called her Pete in high school, but one of the other early founders is on her way here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I almost want to invite you to fill up a chair. Yeah. 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 Come and yeah. sit up the front and yeah. add if you want to. It's fabulous. Sorry. The, oh, no, one of the things that I neglected to do was to try to acknowledge all those people past the, the, the um, panel to acknowledge or remember those people that we are missing. Um, so I know Carol could talk about some of the lawyers and already has, but can you remember any of the other people? I mean, that's fabulous. Joelle is here. And we, yeah. Aaron Weiser, um, Kelly Peterson, Pete Peterson, um, Simon Kanapis, Sonia Kanapis, um, Bugs, Stan, um, Chris Trindle, Ben, um, Jacob. Um, God, I see all these faces on this table too, and I can't remember some of their names. It's wild. Um, I need to go back to my mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you sure you're okay? Oh, that's Please, you're welcome. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I wasn't in high school then. Oh, <laughs> helpful. Yeah, totally. <laughs> no, it was exciting. The walkout was really exciting. So tell us yeah. about your memory of the walkout. So we... So that happened um, in 96. Yeah, so we um, decided to make flyers and walk out. We printed little flyers that just said walk out Friday at 10. Yeah. And we passed them out, and then we heard, I think, either Friday morning or Thursday afternoon, they said that they were going to have a multicultural assembly at that time. And we knew it was because they wanted to stop the walkout, and they thought that we wouldn't walk out of a multicultural assembly. So, <laughs> And it, it kind of worked. So we yeah. just spread the word at that point, because everybody had the flyers. So we spread the word that we were going to walk out after the assembly. And we were all in there. And they actually, that morning, they called all of us. Um, they called our names over the announcement system and asked us to come to the principal's office. And I didn't go because I thought that they were gonna keep us there, and they did. Yes. They kept all the other students there. Everybody totally. went. They, they would told do them that. they would do that. Yeah, they told them that there was a death threat against them, they would do and that they couldn't them. release them from the office. Yeah. So. Oh. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, but my my favorite memory was at the end of the assembly, getting up and starting to scream, "Walk out!" And that really homophobic vice principal was locking the door, like. Yeah. Gave me this dirty look, and I just like pushed the door open past him. So that was, was good. Yeah. 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 Exciting. And I, I wish I'd stayed involved longer, but then I kind of graduated and took off. So. Yeah. And that was like so important, though. I mean, I think this was like yeah. it was like so clear that like it was just being present and keeping the mo like keeping that momentum going. Right. Like I literally walked in the door, and it was like, oh. Okay, like there's <laughs> this court case that needs to happen, and like just took that while. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. That was something that I was thinking of. Um, if at the ACLU, that's kind of part of taking care of a case because there was that beginning, that walkout. Then, yeah. then there's all these other pieces along the way, and people are graduating, and yeah. you need different plaintiffs and all of that. So, it's it's a, a constant process for a number of years. So it can yeah. go. It can be between directors, it can be between attorneys, and everybody has to pick up the ball and go. But I'm, I'm so grateful that you guys like picked up the ball and <laughs> oh, kept it going. Thank, thank you for starting. <laughs> I know. I, know. Yeah. I want to give you a oh, chance. Oh, here. Chance. Brian, did you come inside? We believe you, we believe you might have oh something to God. say. <laughs> Look at this. I wasn't anticipating saying this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've just started calling you. Would you like to say something? In whatever capacity you are comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to sit down? Yeah. Okay.
Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry. Yeah, sure. You're the third plaintiff on the case. I was totally anticipating just sitting out there and listening, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, yeah, that's what the yeah, web writes yeah. into roles. It's all inclusive all the time. Can I really? I agree. <laughs> yeah. My name is Kelly Peterson. Um, along with several of my friends at East High School, we started the Gay Straight Alliance at East High in the uh, fall of 1995. So, yeah. <laughs> so a friend of mine like said, "Hey, were you invited to this?" And I was like, "It's not the 20 year anniversary. It's like the, it's almost 23." And then yeah. I was like, "It's the lawsuit." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so here we are. And then Joellen invited me. So and uh, this, yeah. this little shy guy is my son. This is Noah. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you very much. For you're so welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we've, Can you, yeah, it's not often you walk into a room of people and say, hey, go and sit in the front of the stage. Um, I want to quickly, I want to get to the point where, you, where we have the audience ask questions, but I want to just quickly run through some of the law stuff and then some perspectives on now. So I'm going to hit the law stuff. So, surprise, surprise, and I hope many of you remember and, and know the Senator Orrin Hatch, because he features strongly in this part of the story. So, Senator from Utah, Orrin Hatch saves the day. <laughs> we'll leave it to the lawyer in the middle to... Yeah, so not only was I a plaintiff, now I'm a lawyer. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so, so I, um, it's, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing and it's been interesting, well, it's just, you know, of course, it's one of those themes that you sometimes can pick out in your life, but now in my job as staff, a senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Utah, I okay. help kids start PSA in school. Yeah. Awesome. And um, it's really incredible to look back on these cases, both the yeah, the East High GSA versus the school board and then the PRISM case. So those two um, cases because you know the first one though, it's a little bit of a mixed ruling, still establishes there we won on one of the claims that declared that it's students have the right to use gay supportive language. <laughs> Just like, it's reassuring. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, but it was an incredible principle to establish, to say that, you know, that, you know, students have a right to, you know, assemble and talk about um, being gay and support each other in, you know, being LGBT. So, plus, and then the second case talks about what cl the club, um, you know, what clubs have to look like. So there's, you know, the, the school district closed all clubs and said they only have curricular clubs. And the first case kind of said, you know, took that and said, okay, we believe you, you're, you have only curricular clubs. Um, and the second case really kind of dove into it a little bit more in the written decision and talk of, talks about um, how principals can't just arbitrarily um, call something a curricular club and then exclude GSAs. So, not to dive too much in the, into the legal legal mumbo jumbo, but I guess I just I wanted to reinforce the fact that we, you know, use these cases every day. Like I use this, these cases every day. And then what Rob was referring to um, with Orrin Hatch is that one of in the the primary case there was the First Amendment legislative act called the Equal Access Act that said all clubs have to be treated equal, and it was originally created with Bible clubs in mind to say that, you know, that kids should be able to get together to talk about their religious ideas and affinities, and, and it was like, okay, well, if that's the case, then <laughs> queer kids get to get to come together and talk about their ideas, so um, it was kind of a, yeah, a very interesting turn of fate. Yeah. Thanks, Oren. Yeah. Thanks, Oren. <laughs> Kids' rights. <laughs> Oren, I think, has subsequently Sorry. would probably be a supporter of gay straight alliances today. Sure. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> 20 years later. He's saying some good things. Yeah. Um, and saying, saying some exciting things. Um, did you ever... Um, I'm just going to ask the our new members of the panel. Did you ever worry about your safety as individuals in that school space and being seen? starting a GSA at your school or be, because Kelly you were very vocal on, on TV and all over the place yeah there's a documentary made where you're one of the one of the key players yeah yeah um 
Not initially. Um, it kind of took like when we got locked in the the teachers' lounge um, during the walkout for me to realize like people are honestly concerned about our safety. Yeah. Um, when the students walked out in support or to protest the ban, all the core members of the Gay Straight Alliance were kind of rounded up and taken to the center of the building. Um, and so we weren't actually in the walkout. Um, and um, it was out of concern for our safety. And then another time I was on uh, like a debate program, I think it was with Rod Decker, and somebody called in a threat <laughs> to the news station. And that was when I was kind of starting to realize that um, this wasn't just like a, I'm fighting for my rights. It was, these people are not afraid to threaten my life. So, <coughs> yeah, that was, that was when I realized that I really, there was some danger to what I was doing. I had my, my parents were concerned, so they wouldn't let me use my name in some of the interviews or my face, which I, I understand where they're coming from, but I'm disappointed because I wish I'd been able to be a little more vocal. Um, and we did, I remember getting some threats, but yeah, mainly, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it seemed more like just like high, like high school nonsense. Yeah. High school back then. Yeah, high school back then. Yeah, <laughs> high school back different. Then. Like, I mean, people were, yeah. Yeah, saying horrible things in classes, like, and that was part of the reason why we wanted to raise visibility yeah. to it. So it was, I think it was honestly worse before and maybe during that first year. Yeah, and then it seemed to, like, I don't know, there, things seemed to settle down, and I think the next year was a lot easier for the kids. And um, I didn't hear so much from, like, everybody that I knew that was still involved about, um, like, what was, like, threats or isolation or. Um, I want to ask. I was going to ask Carol about um, impact on her work life, but I'm going to just because we were talking about family a little earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the impact on your families or the support or non-support that came from your families um, through this whole process? Because I think that all friends, <coughs> the support structure is obviously really important to pull something like this off. And I don't know if uh, they'll start with Ivy and then move along or whatever. Yeah, however you want to go through. Yeah. Like definitely, I mean, in order to have the case, there had to be familial um, consent. So I had the support of my mom. My mom's also an attorney who helped um, homeless folks and, <clears throat> again, really valued um, seeing people. So I had a lot of support. She's also um, a little Jewish woman and we had already <laughs> always been a little feisty, feisty Jewish four foot woman. like nothing feisty little <laughs> Jewish lady so we had uh, often actually been targets already um, because we were in Utah and yeah um, unfortunately so um, it wasn't something that scared them at all um, I think it scared them that I was getting targeted a bit um, and of course that freaked them out but I again it did seem much bigger than us and didn't really, when you're young, it doesn't really matter. Well, you had a lot of support from your family. They became I, a big part of our case. Yeah. Um, my parents' journey to support started at really not understanding, and then, like, they kind of did a 182 um, to really being supportive, wonderful parents. And, Ooh. um, my mom was mostly concerned about, like, my mom really seemed to think that I was in danger when I was like, everything's fine, and she's like, you don't know what could happen to you. Um, but I think that's because my mom was from the generation that witnessed the civil rights movement. And so she was like, you know, you're, you're a teenager and you think that you're invincible and you don't realize what these people can do to you. And um, my older sister was a phenomenal source of, like, support and like getting my parents to a place of understanding and I was also really lucky that I had older gay relatives that my parents were close to mm -hmm. and so they had people that they loved that they could talk to about this and um, yeah my parents um, I think that they were very much a product of where they grew up and when I, they just, they had kind of a journey of love, I think that's the best way to put it, 
which was that they loved me and they wanted the best for me. And the best for me was just to be good parents. Um, I'm going to wrap up with just one or one or two more questions. But so the case happens, the case gets won. Tell us about that, Carol. No. I'm happy. Yeah. Oh. Well, the tell us about winning the won. case. Well, yeah, I was, so at like? that point I was uh, in my, I think, sophomore year uh, at NYU, and I was like, ring, ring, oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to go play soccer again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was, that's the thing, and like, I again, I have such an, it's, a, it's such an interesting thing to think back on it now, because, you know, I litigate cases that take, you know, five years, and um, really understanding where the plaintiffs are coming from that bo it's both incredibly important um, to them and and to the people that it will affect afterwards and then also that you know plaintiffs and high school students and, and people have their lives that continue while the case is going on so um, but I mean the what was happening happening procedurally is that uh, won a little but lost kind of at the district level like it they, they basically said you know yeah they once you know they were violating your rights before but now they've sort of closed all the clubs and we think their policy is is okay to to, to deny any non-curricular club and so then that was appealed and um, taken to the Tenth Circuit and they were you know writing all the papers to have that court to, um, decide and then the school district settled and that was also around the time that the, the prism case was being decided and that the school district settling and sort of giving up that fight allowed both of those cases to end and allowed for GSAs to start being created in the Salt Lake School District. Yeah. We like really did take multiple tactics. We had the non-curricular club tactic, we had a curricular club tactic, and then we had the student organizations that were like organizing tactic. Tell us about pulling all of that together, Carol, because you were... Well, I, I think, actually, I don't think I was there when, at the end of the case. I would, Danny, you were the director then. <laughs> when it ended, when it ended I, I don't think so, actually. <laughs> I, I was at the end of when well, Danny was the next Wendy. director of the ACLU, just so, so you yeah, know. <laughs> and then Karen. <laughs> Karen, <laughs> Karen, <laughs> Karen <laughs> oh, okay, so, so there wasn't actually a director at the ACLU when this all happened, but it magically happened. But I do want to draw your attention to a quote I found by one Ms. Carol Gennardi, February 22nd, 1996. She said in the, in, in the press, one day we will look back on this as one of the most shameful episodes in Utah history. But then again, I say that once a month. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to wrap up, one, one more question. Um, would you have done anything differently? Um, I think, well, I think I just sort of accepted that we could continue to meet after school and that was good enough. And I feel like we sort of accepted second class citizenship, mm -hmm. saying that, okay, we'll just meet after school. That's that's enough. And I'm so proud of you guys for what you did. Well, thank you. It's so wild. Like, this is so powerful, for real. Like, what a beautiful um, yeah. legacy. Yeah. And, like, for real, like, it is, like, profoundly moving to see everyone here, too, and how. This ripple is so real, and I want to, we all want to just keep it, keep it going, and support you however we can, and being active, and showing up, and like all of it. <laughs> and then sticking around long enough to go to the ACLU to talk to them about this day, this wonderful GSA conference and everything, yeah. and um, to sit down <laughs> and realize that she was a plaintiff in the case. I mean, it, I did cry. <laughs> but it is, it's so, it's so wonderful to see not only what kind of law was crafted for that, but what wonderful, amazing people grew up out of it. I'm going to...
open it up to the floor, but before I do, I'll just, I'll run through, anyone can just put your hand up and signal and I'll take questions, but usually what happens, the floor kind of dwindles and then it's difficult to wrap it all up, but I'm going to wrap up the formal part now, but just, I found this quote and I was struck by it and I think it's just the perfect time to read it is now rather than a bit later, and it's by a 12th century theologian and author, John of Salisbury. Isaac Newton then subsequently stole it later. But the original quote was... Oh, sorry, Carol Gennady. <laughs> we are like dwarves sitting on the shoulders of giants. We see more and things that are more distant than they did. Not because our sight is superior to theirs or because we are taller than they, but that because they raised us up and by their great stature, they added to ours. And it is monumental to think about that in terms of the young people who are here today. Think about that. So thank you very much to our panelists. But time for questions, yes. Joel Briscoe, I was on the school board. Joel Briscoe. Can I give you some insider views that you probably haven't heard yet? Yeah, Joel, right. you can come and stand at this podium <laughs> soon. <laughs> I, I don't want to stand at the podium. Life, you, you, need, you need to be in the spotlight. I ran for the school board in 1998. I want you to know how much I love these women. I ran for the school board in 1998 partially because of what they did, because I wanted to overturn that ban, because I thought that ban was unjust. I was a high school teacher at Manitou High School. So here's some things you haven't heard, okay? As a member of the school board, I sat in Mr. Peterson's office at his high school with a teacher who was one of his good friends, a history teacher, and he told me that when he got the application for the GSA, that he picked it up and read it and he threw it in the wastebasket. And then he said, I can't do that. I can't do that. And he reached into the wastebasket and he picked it up and he picked up the phone and he called Superintendent Robles and said, so I've got some students at East High, I want to from the Gates Great Alliance, we need to talk about it. So he, his initial response was, no, I can't, no, no, we can't deal with that at East High. And then he thought, no, these kids have a right to make this application. Now the school board voted four to three to deny clubs. So there's one thing you didn't mention, which is critical. Warren Hatch is a U.S. Senator and people down south were not allowing some students to form Bible clubs. So they pass, it's the concept, the legal term is viewpoint discrimination. You cannot practice viewpoint discrimination. You cannot say as a principal or an assistant principal or a member of a school district, we're going to allow this club and not that club because I like this club and not that club. On the floor, Barney Frank, one of the first openly gay representatives in those Congress, said, you do realize when you pass this for these students down south that one day someone's going to want to form a gay club and you're going to have to allow it. Okay? Barney Frank, Barney Frank was looking into the future. He was a seer. And he said, you know, the language is the language, and right now it's Bible clubs. What's it going to be next time? I think I have an idea who, who the... School board member was who handed you, who, who tried to tweak you. It disappoints me that they would do that. It makes me shameful to think that they would say that. To the I know, I don't want to. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so they said, look, and based on Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the Supreme Court opinion. And she said, you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint, but maybe you could allow curricular clubs. So they, I sat in an assistant superintendent's office and they had files five to six inches thick. And they, at every high school, they would say, you want a club, you prove to us your curriculum related, and I, I remember the forms. And you had to show where in the state core curriculum your, your proposed club had to go in. So if you wanted a French club, you had to show that there was a French I, a class taught in the school, or if it wasn't a class taught in the school, it was in the state core curriculum. And they had, for each high school, they had files that way. I thought, that's stupid. Yeah. Let the kids form the clubs. This is not a threat. These are kids who need to talk, right? So you could get a French club, but could you get a Simpsons club? Well, could you show me where it was in the curriculum, right? Could you show it where it was in the curriculum? And then what you haven't heard, because I haven't commented on it publicly until today, was they shut down. I mean, we, we could close in Utah. You can close meetings for discussing lawsuits, personnel, or purchase property. 
right? So we close school board meetings when we purchase property on the west side because you don't want the people to build two new schools, and we built Northwest Middle, and we built a couple of other schools. Mm -hmm. So we shut down meetings, and we had someone who was a scientist from the Attorney General's office, he was a good attorney, yet he couldn't hold a candle to the lawsuits, to the what was being written to us by, we're getting briefs from Los Angeles, from <laughs> Chicago, from Washington, D.C., from New York City, and they were brilliant, and they're still in a couple of boxes in my office, Georgia, and I have them all. And they were wonderful. So they said, okay, let's do the curriculum. We'll do the curriculum thing, prison club. I can't remember exactly what it stood People for. People respecting important social movements. <laughs> and as I read through that brief, as a, I was a social studies teacher. I taught AP U.S. government. And I'm flipping through that going, that's part of my curriculum. That's in my textbook. In my textbook, teaching students of Bountiful High School, we talk about the Supreme Court. And we talk about Supreme Court decisions. We teach Bowers versus Hardwick. We teach the Texas case. We talk about all these issues, about homosexuality in America, and I'm talking to my 12th graders at Bountiful High, damn right those kids at East High have a chance to talk about this stuff, they get this club. And they would come down and talk to the school board members, and the school board members like me going, let the kids have their club, and other school board members saying no. By the time we had to vote, and they realized the jig was up, I mean they, they realized they lost. The vote was 6-1, Cliff Hickby, who was a a, a guy I have a lot of respect for, represents Rose Park area, voted no. I, I knew we, he didn't make a, you know, he didn't scream and yell and jump up and down. He just said he couldn't vote for it. Some of the people who voted yes weren't crazy about voting yes. I was celebrating. When we started writing policy, I had a couple of gay teachers, or lesbian teachers, the East Side called me up and I was the undesignated school board representative that they felt they could talk to. And I went over, I remember going to their apartment on 13th South, sitting in their apartment, their home, their home as we discussed language. They said, we're not sure we like this language. But we, this could be better. And we negoti I nego negotiated for them some language changes. I used the law when a student three years later at Bountiful High School handed me a note said, Mr. Briscoe, I want to form my gay straight alliance. And I was the advisor, one of two teachers who advised the gay straight alliance at Bountiful High School. I lost some, I lost the principal, let me know later. I applied for some positions I didn't get. I would do it a thousand times again for those students to have a safe place to be after school Thank where they felt comfortable. Thank you. Yeah. You are a teacher. I, I, want, I want you to know how important what they did was in bringing, because I'm sure other states have tracked on Utah. And three weeks ago, I was at Southtown Mall. I, that's something else today. We had some students on a bus in Parkland, Florida, some in Utah students talking about gun violence in schools and gun violence in general and violence in general in our communities. I had a student from a school, I gave her my card, I hope she calls me, we need to talk ACL Utah. This student's in a Utah County High School and wants to form a club to deal with gun violence and she's been denied. And I talked to her after and I said, no, let's talk because they cannot deny you that club. They're either going to have to shut everything down in the district and the, and the, and the, and the district and make it all curriculum related and we saw how that worked. It was a piece of crap, it was garbage. Or they're going to have to allow your club because they cannot discriminate against you on the basis of the viewpoint because the Supreme Court said so and because the court says so because of these. They had their tires slashed. They were abused verbally and otherwise in classrooms. I talked to teachers and the principal about it. And they put up with it because they knew that what they were doing was right. And there's other stuff they haven't told you. So my hat is off to you. Thank you for all you did for this generation of many generations. I want to say thank you, and I also want to say this is the reason we need to pay attention to the elections of our school board members. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I saw Leah's eyes light up when she saw it. We I love a club fight. Love a club fight. I feel that it would be dangerous to go against it. In the back, yes. yes. That's a fabulous question. Can any of you reach back? Have you 
Yeah, I mean, I think what I think that's incredible. It's such a good question um, because there are. Yeah, I, I, what I can just say is that in my job right now, I, I get students who reach out who want to form a GSA and they feel really alone. And our current club law is in, is you know it's it's viewpoint neutral, but it's very complicated. And so I do feel like sometimes we lose ground because the schools are making it so complicated to renew each year. I mean, we clear, we have some strongholds. Salt Lake School District has a lot of really supportive teachers and administrators, and there's like a stronghold, but um, there's ground that hasn't been reached. And um, so I think that, yeah, Utah Pride Center just hired a GSA coordinator, um, and I know that ACLU of Utah is really committed to thinking um, about ways to strengthen our support of, G of, of kids and gender and sexuality clubs um, and of course the GSA network is awesome. I want to add to that, I'm just going to quickly just ask Carol a question to, to talk about that situation in, that happened through email where you came in and nipped it all in the bud but I just want to give a bit of context it's a link to your question was twofold. What's happening in East High at the moment and, and currently in schools I think is a, a really important piece of work that we are hoping to do here, and I know that the GSA network are doing in their spaces. But remembering the past and knowing your history is just as important. And Carol can quickly talk to an email chain that she got copied in on a few months ago. But I, you know, basically what I did was somebody wrote, um, a, a person has been denied uh, having a gay straight alliance in Park City. And I, you know, I was shocked that that had happened but I'm not following the law. I just said, you know, the ACLU has settled this case, so I think you need to really look into it and talk to the ACLU. Well, just like so many cases that we have, it's not really over completely. And so I turned it over to them at the ACLU, and, I, and now you're involved in it, right? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, run with it. <laughs> Uh, just in front of the room. I just wanted to comment yeah. on, the, on, her, on that comment back there before yes, go. the subject. Yes, perfect. Of Please subject. do. Um, one of the takeaways today was the, is the bravery of the plaintiffs. And from my vantage point at the office, is, you know, we, you know, basically doesn't go around trolling for cases. We don't know about them. And when you said what's going on now, you're in a better position. seeing what's going on at the schools, what, what discrimination is going on that could be against women or uh, racial discrimination or ethnicity or viewpoint yeah. discrimination or sexuality and uh, having the bravery that these guys have. Um, it, it, it actually, we're dying, we're dying, we're dying, we're dying when people call us up in cases that would just say, you know, like when he just said that about the gun club, you know, all of our eyes lit up. Yeah. Yeah, we can't help it. And, and it's, uh, it's more about, like, um, people on the ground paying you know, attention. Like he says, you pay attention to the history just so you know when something's wrong or your gut feeling. And, and it's more about you guys on the ground paying attention and coming, coming with, uh, with ideas about what's going on wrong where, where you sit. liberal bastion right now but like beyond that it's not it's not and like we're talking even just like the um seattle or sorry so I'm, I, live, I live in seattle now uh the salt lake like main corridor if you're just like even in like sandy like jimmy who is one of the coordinators here at uh he like he grew up in sandy like he was definitely 2010 he graduated and that's like 
got some we got some work to do here. So yeah. Yeah. I definitely feel like I'm a little more engaged with the Seattle scene, but like in the '90s, we knew the trans situation was like not even close to being supported, and like in that sense too. Like I, yeah, we got so much to do. I'm gonna go to this question here. Do you still have your question? Sir? Yeah, it's it's less a question and more an appreciation. I'm the co-executive director of GSA Network, the Woo! national organization. Um, yeah. uh, we're also celebrating our 20 year anniversary this year. Um, our organization formed in 1998 because youth in California who are in an LGBT youth support group wanted to form GSA clubs in solidarity with the case in Utah, um, and so. Our network formed because of the work that was happening here, um, and we, you know, talk about ripples, right? Oh, it's um, who who would have thought that there would be a national movement that, and maybe maybe you all did, uh, or maybe you know, um, <laughs> Barney Frank did at least, uh, <laughs> that there would be a national movement of young people supported by adults in a very similar way that you, as a young as young people, were supported by adults in your activism. So just to the power of, of young people, to the power of trans and queer youth. Um, to transform the world, and we're seeing that now, you know, almost a generation on what that looks like. Yeah. And even seeing like the verbiage on the GSE network, I mean, it's so good. It's so good just to see how we are transitioning our, our own language to be more inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your work that you're doing. You. One more in the back. Sorry, one more question. Hi, uh, my name is Randy Hoffman. I've been in Salt Lake a couple of years now. Um, I studied queer history. Um, and so, part of what I'm interested in studying is some of the Utah history about how time and space in Utah has been queer. Um, and I'm just curious as to how you see what you all did, how that kind of changed some of the local dialogue around LGBT issues, um, obviously helped the emergence of PSAs in high schools to kind of help change the space. Like, did people even talk about it in the 90s? I mean, Salt Lake like has always been queer. Let's say that. <laughs> there was, you know, yeah. Look at the pictures. The pictures yeah. behind you. There was um, bricks. And yeah. the, you know, yeah, we had, uh, yeah. Um, so, but, I mean, in many ways, Utah culture has, had, has um, been identified by this counterculture kind of narrative, you know. Like the, the punk scene, and I, I'd say part of it, the queer scene, and it, you know, this was definitely one experience of it being so front facing, and you know, yeah, front facing from like in adorable kids like Ivy. You should see her <laughs> sixteen year old yeah, pictures. Yeah, so, of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that the there are always, I think there were always spaces that could be found here in Salt Lake, and I'm excited for you to continue to look at that, um, but yeah, being able to be, yeah, more open and have to claim public space, yeah, was, that was definitely part of that, this fight. I, uh, I remember just like one of my motivations was like all the horrible comments that you hear other students making. Um, and probably because they didn't know that there were gay people in the classroom or that they were affecting people. So I feel like, you know, for the people who were, you know, just ignorant of it, didn't realize how much they were hurting people, it helped them be more aware. And then it also brought some more people out of the woodwork because they started the Safe Club, which Students Against F at East. That they tried oh, to start wow. that because yeah. we were starting the Gay Straight Alliance. Yeah. So just, I don't know, it, it, it polarized things, but I think it helped people who who like just were being insensitive but didn't get it like be more sensitive because it wasn't it didn't always feel like a safe environment like at least what people were saying yeah yeah, yeah. Did you, sorry kelly you were agreeing vehemently there yeah, yeah. I, was, I was agreeing with her that you know, a lot of the time it just didn't feel safe and like one of my motivations for starting the gay straight alliance was there was a youth group at uh, the stonewall center but like I had to lie to my parents to go to it every Tuesday, so I had to find something else to be doing on Tuesday night. And it just seemed, I was like, if it's this ridiculous for me, and my parents weren't always like, my parents weren't helicopter parents, so it was easy enough to like get away. And I was like, how would this be for other people? Like if you couldn't just say like, I'm going to go to, out to coffee with my friends. <laughs> um, 
And so I wanted to bring it someplace that was accessible to all of us, which was school. And it just made no sense to me. So, and that, like, that's part of the history was that, like, you kind of had to have an in. Yeah, it was a small group of people. Yeah, like, or a small group of people that you knew. And so, like, we had the Stonewall Center, there was Gay Pride Day, but to get any kind of support, you kind of had to have, like, an inroad to it already which was the motivation for getting support to people where they were. One last question. We're gonna, there'll, there'll be time to talk to individually in a second. One last question. Right. Just based on what you were just saying, you know, I think one of the things that we're seeing currently um, is schools that will require parental signatures to join any club. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if there's what can we do about Jenna's yeah. also the other co-executive yes, director. The, the yes. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think we're, we've um, thought about this also as a two-part. Um, Rob, I don't know if you're going to mention it, but yes. have, have another looking forward. Um, I think we definitely have some ideas about how to make things better because, yeah, our current state law that we have a very detailed law around um, school clubs and it requires parental permission for every club. And um, it requires that you have like a detailed description of what you're gonna do, and if you bring an outside speaker in, you have to archive the material that they bring in. I mean, so, but yeah, particularly the parental permission, I think um, it's, it's bad, and it exists here. It does currently. Mm -hmm. So this is part one. I'm gonna close it off here. I'll, I'll have some closing remarks in a second. But so as um, Leah said this is part one. The next we will do something in October again, live stream it if you're interested. Um, but uh, because the GSA network will be back home. But one of the things we want to do is, is to look forward. What is our next, where are our next fights? Because I mean, we've seen even in this discussion, we've had this fight 20 years ago. It continues. There are steps that still need to be taken. And that's exciting, it's daunting, but they're steps that we, we know we need to move on. Question on yes. Have you thought about taking that step and approaching one of us about running legislation? Do you think it's the time now when you're looking at parental consent? Uh, yeah. 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 Like the officials in the room that still needs to be state legislature? I hear you. Yes. I hear you. Yes. Yes. I'm just saying, a lot of times people, um, as you were mentioning, we don't know what's going on half the time because yep. we're trying to juggle all these worlds. So when people bring stuff to us, it's much easier because the timing is the right time. I mean, so I think there are. There's only 13 of us, but still, that's yeah. there, another. So introduce yourself. Inch I was going to yeah. uh, introduce yourself secretly sitting in the back there. We're so happy to have you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Representative Angela Romero, so this is my district. Yay! Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, Representative Briscoe and I, and we have other colleagues, are always yeah. interested in legislative issues, but if people don't bring them to us, yeah. I and mean, there's so much that goes on. We can't do anything about it. So yeah. I'm just encouraging some of you if this is something that you're interested in right. and it, we have to look at it strategically. If something you want to yeah. run that's coming session it might not be one of us, but it could be someone on our, our legislative team. Uh, we'll have more than 13 of us. Yes. Thank you, well, representatives. Thank you both yeah, for being here. You. And that was certainly our plan is to bring Equality Utah and bring our representatives in to start to talk about well, what are these steps that we need to take legislatively. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I want to finish off by just one point that you made um, the, on Kelly's point, where you said you know you could go to some, you could go to the Stonewall Center and you could go to Gay Pride. Um, just finishing off here to talk to the point about how we've changed. This is the article again from February 1996, and I was suddenly reminded of it when we were asked how Utah's changed. It says here, um, last June, about 5,000 people attended Salt Lake City's <laughs> annual Gay Pride March. I'm happy to report we had about 75,000 people at this year's Salt Lake City Gay Pride. It's Gay Pride, they said Gay Pride, Pride March. So things are changing and it's do people like this, people like our legislators showing up, it's the small things that are happening. And I thank you all so much for coming. It's meant a lot to me as somebody who is new to Utah, who wasn't here to experience this, to hear these first hand stories. Our stories make a difference. So please, there are a couple of snacks there where Kevin is, there's something to drink. Please stay around and mingle. I'm hoping we're getting a photo with our 
guests at the table and our special extra guests who I'm so thankful are here. Thank you, thank you for coming. Please feel free. You're not going anywhere without a photo.